Okay. Welcome, everyone. We're going to call the uh, the uh, meeting to uh, to order, and uh, we are uh, uh, reconvening from uh, closed session. And at this point, we don't have any reportable items from closed session, but we are going to uh, reconvene this meeting to complete our closed session uh, after this meeting uh, uh, this evening. So uh, uh, I have a feeling we're going to move through our agenda quickly today because I think we have some motivation for that. And so uh, I would like uh, to uh, have everyone please stand and have uh, Isabella, if she would lead us in the flag salute, please. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I would like to uh, welcome everyone back for the uh, spring semester. It's uh, uh, nice to see all the friendly faces. Most anyway, I think. <laughs> uh, I have been advised that our item uh, uh, five, the uh, uh, presentation by uh, Assemblyman uh, Devin Mathis is going to be delayed. He has some traffic issues, so uh, we are going to uh, insert that item in the agenda uh, as it becomes, uh, as uh, Mr. Mathis becomes available. So with that, uh, per board policy 2350, any person may address the board at this time, either on an agenda item or other matters of interest to the public that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. A maximum of five minutes is allowed for each speaker with a maximum time of 15 minutes per item unless otherwise extended by the board. Uh, do we have any public comments today on items on the agenda? Apparently not. Do we have public comments today on concerning items that are not on the agenda? I see we have one and yeah. would you please come up to the podium and uh, <coughs> Uh, mm -hmm. and, pardon me? And there was another one here. Okay. Right. Uh, and please give us your uh, name and. Do we need any other information? Uh, no. No, my name is Welcome. Roy. Huh? Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. No, my name is Roy Kendall. And I, I, the only person I know here is Greg Sherman, but I'm glad to meet Greg. <laughs> um, there's. There's recent evidence that cannabis use can cause intermittent paranoid schizophrenia. Now, most people don't know this. And you're probably wondering, well, how is that? Think of the brain. The brain has a synapse. Most of you are familiar with the synapse. The synapse is a space between the neurons in the brain. And this is where learning takes place, is in this synapse, space between the neurons in the brain. Well, the way it was explained to me a couple of times, is that think of this synapse like carburetor points. And your carburetor points have to hit right in order for the engine to run right. So think of the synapse in your brain as carburetor points. And with the THC, which is part of the active ingredient in marijuana and cannabis, then instead of hitting correctly, these points will miss. And after the THC level would reduce or go down, guess what? these points don't always come back together and hit correctly and normally. Now, in many cases, they would and they do. But there are cases where they're not going back and hitting correctly. And this is the best way that I've seen it explained to me so far. Uh, that's, of course, not anatomically or biologically, scientifically correct as far as the mechanism. But there's a lot of, uh, what shall I say, um, <coughs> uh, evidence that this is a, a problem. So the, the point is that most people do not know this. Now, if this is true, then people need to know this in order to make an informed decision. Uh, imagine a jury that did not have all the facts concerning a case, and we're supposed to decide whether this person is guilty or innocent or whatever. Okay? 
So what I have today is I have a little test, okay, if you don't mind, and I'd like to just pass this out. There's one question on the, on the surface here, one question only, and please do not open the binder with the test on the cover until after the meeting. Just take it home. Uh, it's a take home, open book, open computer, open notes, whatever. You can even, you know, whatever. Uh, mic card and uh, email and phone is on the inside cover. So, um, but what it amounts to is this is not for credit and it's ungraded. And the answers, though, are in this binder. Okay, at least, and the answers, I think, are pretty obvious. Um, and I do not want to read to you anything that I know you can read for yourself. Thank okay. you. I just don't want to take any extra time, and I appreciate the time. So, but all, this test is also a request, and the request is this, that if there is sufficient evidence that cannabis use will have an adverse effect upon COS and its students, that you form a committee or a group to consider all the options, if any, and decide what course of action is in the best interest of COS and its students. Okay? That's right. Can I pass these off? Sure. And that's it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Kendall. Yeah. Here, just if you leave them here, we'll make sure they get sent down the way. Okay. I, I do have to tell you that uh, uh, even though this may be an open book test, uh, uh, Board Member Sherman, I'm not sure that he even does yeah. well on, on, uh, on open book but, tests. I don't know either. <laughs> but, but we do know each other, so that's a full something. disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> and I, if it's all right, I do have a copy of this for those that would want one in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, we have... Uh, uh, another public comment today, so please uh, state your name and uh, thank you. welcome as well. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Tim Heyer. Uh, I currently serve as the superintendent of Exeter Unified School District, which is a feeder district to College of the Sequoias. But tonight I'm here uh, introducing myself in another capacity, uh, and that is a candidate for the county superintendent of schools. Wanted to briefly just share uh, a little bit about my experience. I provided you with a postcard and a note, has my contact information on there, my email, my phone number, uh, and also my social media um, address. Um, if you would like to reach out to me and have a discussion about my vision and how my skills and experience can complement what's currently going on with the County Office of Ed uh, in partnership with COS. Um, I've been an educator in Tulare County for 21 years. In fact, our very own Earl Mann had a hand in that, hiring me as an ag teacher in Woodlake back in the day. I uh, worked through uh, the high school assistant principal principalship and then eventually became the superintendent in Woodlake, where I was able to um, unify the district, uh, the, two the two districts, the elementary and the high school district. Um, and then six years ago, I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to move uh, just down the road a piece to Exeter. And I've been serving as the superintendent there uh, for quite a number of years. Also involved uh, with youth sports, coached Little League Baseball and currently coaching club soccer. And I guess the, the biggest thing for me right now in that world is that uh, I've helped six soccer players this year um, sign contracts to play at the next level. I'm really excited about that. So again, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, again, my information is there. If you'd like to reach out to me, I'd love to have a cup of coffee or visit about education in Tulare County. Tim, you can also say you know me too. I do know Greg Sherman. Do you have a binder with the test in it? <laughs> that was the test. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tim, Thank I you. think what uh, Board Member Sherman's trying to say, you're hired. Thank you. Yeah, hired, right? Uh, Tim, thank you for, uh, for being with us today. And uh, uh, please don't feel obligated that you have to stay for, for the whole meeting. I don't think we would... Uh, count that against you if you felt so inclined to uh, to leave before the meeting finishes up. So it's kind, of so nice. <laughs> kind of nice to be at a board meeting when it's not yours though. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know about that. All right, so let's move on to uh, executive uh, staff reports, uh, starting off with uh, our student trustee report. Uh, Isabella, please. Hi everyone, so our elected office of student senate, it remains the same as last semester and also we elected our senators so all of them have their capacity and they've already been reaching out to administration on that. This year we also are doing Valentine's grams which will be on Wednesday. If you have an ASB sticker, they'll be $2. If you don't, they'll be $3. 
And I'm really happy to say that we had this Valentine's Gram for the children in our local hospitals. So we met our CAP at Valley Children's, and now we're being able to send them throughout the state. We made, I think, over 1,400 cards, and all the students were involved in it. We had a booth out there, and the club's got ICC points, and I'm going to be speaking about that then. We also got our national student reps for the conference in Washington, D.C. That'll be myself, Shane, and Ginger, so we'll all be representing COS in that capacity. We have several of our students at the Accreditation Summit, and I believe that's all I have to report. Very good. Any uh, questions of uh, Isabel? When do you go to D.C.? March 16th through the 21st. Well, have fun. Have you been there before? No, I haven't. Oh, have a great time. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, board member report starting uh, at my left with board members on walk. Report. Uh, I would just say that we met, the golf committee met for the first time uh, last week. Uh, the tournament is scheduled for the COS President's Cup, is scheduled for uh, April 27th. So, and we're increasing the number of people, our number of teams to 26 teams this year. So. 27. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Mr. Matt? Nothing. Yes, I just want to quickly um, thank those from the college that came to support me the night of the Tillery Chamber dinner. Um, it was uh, a great evening. I appreciated it. I was humbled and honored. Um, I, I, it's okay if I never do that again, but I, I appreciate it. <laughs> There's a reason they say once in a lifetime, Lauren. Yeah. I just want to say thank you to my COS family that was there. It meant a lot to me. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I attended the um, same type of function as to Larry uh, in Corcoran, and that was uh, this last Thursday. Uh, President Carasosa was there along with Foundation uh, uh, CEO uh, Tim Foster and it was uh, a very nice function not nearly as long or as nice as the one in Tulare but uh, well not, not nearly, nearly as long not nearly as long uh, <laughs> so uh, that was uh, they, they were both uh, fun time so uh, with that uh, foundation report I see Mr. Foster yeah, is uh, fortunately yet yeah, uh, Mr. Foster is home ill tonight, oh, not wow. able to be here with us, but um, I did let him know that I would inform the board that he was out ill, so he'll have his report prepared in full force next board meeting. Very good. Accreditation report, Dr. Lucerna. Good evening. I have a written report in front of you on accreditation update. Oh, Megan's passing it down. There we go. So um, update, we are uh, in the final stages of reviewing the institutional self-evaluation and it will be going forward through the district governance process in April and presented to you here at the board uh, in June. We held the summit on the quality focus essay and uh, that was Friday, January 26th and we had over 80 participants and following review of those um, proposals, we, we determined we would be covering two topics in our quality focus essay, essay, streamlining the developmental course sequence in English, math, and ESL, and then also implementing multiple measures, placement, and assessment. And so we're working on drafting that report, and we will report out on that, those two topics, over the next three and a half years and in our midterm report. And then again, we, I think you got this update in January when I was out ill. The accreditation site visit is now scheduled for October 1st through 4th, 2018. So make sure that is in your calendars. I think that's a change from the That was the change, date. yeah. So those are the new dates. October, but I, I, we gave you those ones in January. So October 1 through 4, 2018. Then as far as the strategic plan, that is in process and we will be sending it forward to the government group, governance groups in March and it should be here before you in April at the board meeting. And then I have a couple of ACCJC updates. The commission met in January to review um, the documents and the actions on the various institutions. What I have attached to your report is all of the findings on the institutions that came out on January 29th from the commission. So as you can see, there's a number of different um, 
results. And the first one is what we will be getting, which is reaffirmed accreditation for seven years on the basis of a comprehensive evaluation. There were four colleges that were there. That is the highest level you can get, which as I said, is what we will be getting. And it is no more reports, everything is just fine. And then you can, the second one is reaffirmed for seven years and requiring a follow-up report. And that's, there were two colleges there. And then the third one reaffirmed for 18 months with a follow-up report, one college there. And the fourth one is reaffirmed with, for 18 months requiring a follow-up report and a visit on the basis of a comprehensive evaluation. There's four colleges there. So the way we can kind of look at this, the rest of them were just uh, follow-ups and, and midterm reports and things, but those top four are the new language, as you can say, from the commission. And what, what I've heard a lot of people say recently is it it's a, seems to be a kinder and gentler commission because you don't see anyone on warning, anyone on probation, no one on show cause. However, what you can look at is the second one, which is the uh, re follow-up report, we probably can think that might be a little bit like a warning because they've got to follow up and make sure they're doing the, the things that they need to do. And the other two that they're reaffirmed for 18 months. And remember that is, you have from the um, Department of Education 18 months to change any compliance issues anywhere that you're not meeting the standard or you're kind of out of time. So these ones are saying you have 18 months to get this done and then you need a follow-up report and then the bottom one is or the fourth one down is a follow-up report and a visit after 18 months. So maybe in other words that might be a little bit like show cause but it's a different kind of language that they're using kinder general gentler language. So we've been reviewing all of these reports and the team the team reports and all of the information but I wanted to make sure you had a chance to see what the last actions were from the commission and the language that they're using. Great. Mr. Er, sorry, Trustee Sherman. No, you're great. Fine. Uh, <laughs> How do you know we're going to get the number one thing? Because I, we are so awesome. <laughs> because our report comments? is amazing. We have solved every problem. I thought maybe we, they've already told you that. No, I'm just so confident, <laughs> Trustee Sherman, that I'm telling you <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Okay. okay. Recorded, you know. Yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> and hold me to it. So, um, I, just to add that in, in uh, the same time, uh, the president of ACCJC, Richard Wynn, also received an update to, or sent out an update to all of the institutions, um, updating kind of the language that they're using in the reports that reflects this. And it says, he said that there's two types of recommendation you can get from a team, and it's a uh, recommendation to meet the standards, which is a compliance recommendation. You have to meet the standards. Or it's a recommendation to improve effectiveness, which is an improvement recommendation. And colleges, with an improvement recommendation, you don't necessarily have to have a response. You don't need to report back to the ACCJC. But with a compliance recommendation, you do need to follow up and show that you've met the standard. And so he also wanted to say that the visiting teams are basically the eyes of the commission, as he said. And the commission isn't always going to give the same response that a team made. So they will either endorse, modify, or delete a team's recommendation based on their review. So the team report isn't the final say. The commission still has an opportunity to review that and change it. And so he wanted to make sure that was clear, and I put that in this handout to you. And then finally, they just elected uh, their vice chair of the commission, and it's Dr. Sonia Christensen, Christian, excuse me, who is the president of Bakersfield College. So she is the new vice chair of the commission. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sermon, for that report <laughs> and uh, superintendent's report. I just wanted to spend a, a couple of minutes this evening giving you a quick update. One of the things that I'm trying to stay in constant contact with is um, the information coming from both the Chancellor's Office and the Legislature regarding the new Community College funding formula. Wanted to make sure that I remind you as board members that a, a committee, a task force of Community College presidents and chancellors has been appointed to begin meeting and reviewing, working with um, the Chancellor's Office and 
uh, the legislative Thank analyst you. office, the Department of Finance to uh, try to influence and provide some guidance and direction for the new funding formula. Um, alongside them is a group of college business officials, the CBOs, and a representative group of those college officials have been meeting as well. And they're um, providing feedback and information also. So just a quick reminder, what we know so far is that the new funding formula is likely going to be divided into three comprehensive parts. About 50% or approximately 50% of the weight of the funding formula will still be determined by uh, FTES and full-time equivalent student units of funding. So there will still be an incentive um, for enrollment to be robust and for colleges to grow. A second 25% of that formula is going to be based on some sort of an economic factor based on the economic demographics of your region. So what we know about state funding formulas when those come out is that areas that are disproportionately impacted by low socioeconomic status tend to get a little bit higher uh, scoring element in that portion of the funding formula because of the correlation between the need for additional resources to close those achievement gaps. And then the third part is the final 25% which is the performance-based mechanism, and that's going to depend on colleges' transfer rates, completion rates for their degrees, and completion rates for certificates. So uh, we're getting uh, feedback from, at least I am, from the CEO's group that conversations are going well, lots of input is being taken in. Um, apparently, both the Chancellor's Office and the um, Legislative Analyst's Office are working on models that districts can start to use to input data and get some sort of an estimate of where their funding levels might land. And then finally, I'll be going to the once a year annual meeting of all of the CEOs coming up on March the 2nd. At that time, we are supposed to be get, getting a firsthand update from the Chancellor's Office and the CEO Committee and maybe even be privileged to see some of the finance models and what they're going to look like. So. Uh, we'll have more information, but it's it's moving along a process, lots of input coming in. Um, hopefully we're going to have the decided upon formula so that we can estimate our revenues by about April. Okay. Thank you for the detailed information, mm -hmm. the best, best as we can have at this point. Any questions for uh, Mr. Carazoso? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, without objection, I'm going to uh, uh, go out of order a little bit here under reports and we're going to have the COSAFA president's update first if, if I could. Uh, Dr. Thank Erickson you. has a uh, commitment that she needs to uh, get off to. Thank you so, so much. Um, this evening I apologize. I'm, I'm teaching a graduate class on change and transformation which I think is very fitting for what uh, College of the Sequoias is going through right now. I wanted to express my thank you to the board of um, having John and Stan meet with us about the Sunshine Letter that we're going to do and delay that a bit for bargaining. And we certainly concur that that's the best choice to wait until after the May 2nd meeting. Um, brief report is just to say that adjuncts are very, con uh, not concerned, very interested in the transitions that are taking place. And I was happy to see that there were about 10 to 12 adjuncts who participated in the great accreditation summit that Dr. Lucerna hosted. And um, also we had 57 adjuncts who came to the convocation because they're also very interested in that and in their division meetings. Even though they aren't teaching on Fridays, they still came to that event. So um, I just continue to get more and more impressed with the level of commitment they have and it goes along with our, our tagline for the, our, our group, which is we add value, we're committed to students, and we want to see the college thrive and continue to grow even more uh, of a permanent fixture and such an influence in the lives of the students of the South Valley. So thank you so much for your support. I enjoy working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Erickson, I believe you said May 2nd. It's March. You Ma meant I March apologize. 2nd. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. Good Thank night. you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Trumbull is here with the uh, Academic Senate Report. Good evening. 
Um, just a quick uh, update. Uh, as I mentioned last time, we had our elections, and our elections were held for new uh, Senate officers last week. Voting took place on all three campuses on Wednesday and Thursday, and the new Academic Senate President is going to be Greg Turner, the new Vice President, Juan Arzola, the Secretary and the State Delegate, Sandra Bergen, and the Equity Committee Chair, Juan Arzola. So they will start their um, tenures um, in June. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, Stan has already mentioned, and it's starting to percolate up throughout the listserv for the Academic Senate Presidents, and that's the funding formula. <coughs> and what we're starting to get now in our listserv are questions about how colleges currently are dealing with degrees. Um, so the latest survey is how many colleges automatically give degrees even if the students don't apply mm -hmm. because that's a way to boost the number of degrees and certificates. But that has other consequences for the students. So mm -hmm. it's one thing that you have to look at very carefully. But it is going to be a huge topic at the plenary session as it will be at everyone's meeting. Okay. Any questions? Yes. What would be a consequence? What would be a bad consequence for the students? There's financial aid implications. Because if they have degrees, sometimes they're not eligible for certain financial aids. So um, it, it, can, it can really bite them. Is that it? That's the only one I know. That's, that's the serious. major one. Yeah. We, we've kicked it around a couple of times as we've talked about that the past several years. But there are, when, as Thea said, when some students apply for their financial aid, their financial aid is good until they have completed their degree. Well, they want a four-year degree, so many students will finish their two years of coursework here, yeah. and they may be eligible for our Associate of Arts degree to then stack their bachelor's degree on top of it. But it, depending on the type of financial aid they're receiving, if they apply for and receive their Associate of Arts degree, their financial aid now has wow. expired because it's the degree. So they'll bypass getting the AA degree, even though they've completed all the units, so that they have their financial aid to continue for the next two years. So we need to get in and sort that out. Right. I mean, and, and even to the point where students have not taken one course. So you just put off taking that one course you need to have completed your degree because then you can just keep going <laughs> and, and get other things yeah, out. Take a few more classes right. before you take the last one. So right. it's, Are they trying it's, to change that? Because that sounds stupid. <laughs> well, that's on tape now, Greg. <laughs> yeah. well, let's wait till Assembly Member Mathis gets here. And we'll sit down. <laughs> yeah, there. It's you penalize somebody for getting a d degree. Yeah, and yeah it's, it's still going on. I mean, again, Greg, I think it goes to the source of the financial aid and the intent of the financial aid. So yes, I think they are trying to sort through that and not have an unintended consequence to the way their financial aid is initially laid out for them. But the issue is that the financial aid comes from so many different sources and we always don't, some of it's federal, we don't have impact yeah. on some of that. Yeah. So it's not, it's not like it's local. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Trimble, thank you for your service to the uh, Academic Senate, and it was a pleasure uh, yeah. having you at the meetings. Mm -hmm. Hope to see you at the meetings. Couple more weeks. Well, she Couple at the more meetings months. still. <laughs> she, she'll be with us. The Greg's official start date is? I think it's June. Uh huh, June. Yeah. So she'll finish so out the year with us. All right. Uh, next on line is the uh, Costa President's uh, update. Uh, I, I have no report at this time. Thank you. Yeah. Glad to see you here, though, and you're back uh, safe and sound from your uh, long uh, uh, motorcycle uh, trip. <laughs> Business trip. All right, uh, CSCA uh, President's uh, uh, update. Mr. Lamar. Just very quickly, the executive board is meeting with the negotiating team and starting to get together our sunshine, which we will be presenting in March. Thank you. Questions? No questions, I presume? No. All right, we'll move on to uh, information items. One, low enrolled justification uh, spring of 18. Great, thanks again. Uh, according to board policy 4071, we are required to present a canceled and low enrolled report to you um, each semester out following census date. And so on your first page of your report is the spring 2018 low enrolled justification report. Uh, starts with agriculture, business, and CFS. 
One of the things that I wanted to point out is that our policy is 15 classes, 15 students for a lecture lab and 20 for a regular lecture. So as you can see, all those, many of these classes are on the list. For example, in business, many of those are 18, 19 students. And so they almost meet the board policy or the requirements of 20 students. We aren't, you know, by, policy maybe, but by practice, not going to cancel a class with 19 students in it. So these are still, although on the low enrolled report, very well enrolled. <laughs> and so um, as you can see, most of these classes are either a single section of the class or they're the only offering in the evening or the only offering on a certain campus or they're required for the programs. So on the first page, you have agriculture, business, consumer family studies. On the second page, we have the um, fine arts, industry and technology, language arts. And again, they're required for graduation courses or they're, uh, we have some dual enrollment courses or um, limited offerings or required for theater, required for the art gallery. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, can I ask yep. a question? Yes, ma'am. If you don't want to answer it here, uh, you can easily email me. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to ask you, and you probably know already, but the Tulare um, English one only has eight students in that dual enrolled. I, I just need some clarification on what happened there, because I do have parents asking me, and I need to understand the process and what happened in Tulare. With the two, I, I don't know the details, but I know some were complaining. Because there was 251, and now I, only, I see there's only eight, and a lot of kids didn't get in because they said it was full. On that I class. don't have the answer for you right because now on that. You but can email I can me, but if I out. could know, just because I'm, I'm surprised to see it low enrolled when, you know, I was told it was full. And anyways, okay. So something. let me. Well, yes, I will find me. out. I will find out and okay. get back no to you. The okay. low enrolled Tulare English one right here with the eight. Okay. Only has eight that was on page in. two. The Tulare Union, union yeah. eight <coughs> un, eight students mm -hmm. in the dual enrollment, and I would I'll have to get details. Yeah. I don't want to attempt to answer it no, right now and, and be even, wrong. And with Western only in the thirteen in there, yep. I'd be curious to see because I know I heard those were full at the beginning of the year, and I know they did the two fifty one one combo. But um, if you could just yeah. answer that, it would help me okay. answer those questions or at least send them in the right direction. Okay. When they have questions, I will so they don't get, get you the correct answer and not and try to speculate <laughs> right now. No problem. That could be an email. Thank you. Okay. So that, those are the industry, technology, language arts. Page three, we have math and engineering, science, and social science. And again, most of these are required for student newspaper, the only section offered. It's required for the degree um, or is the only offering on a certain campus or in the evening. Okay. And then on page four, you have the canceled class justification report. Again, these go by um, area, and most of these were canceled prior to the start of the semester because they either had three, two, one student enrolled, and we realized that the enrollment was not going to come up, and so they were canceled based on that. And they're also, there's on page two of that second report, there's another list of classes that were canceled. That's it. That's it. Other questions for Dr. Lucerno? Yes. Uh, what is the maximum enrollment for our language arts program, for our math programs, and for our social science programs? Maximum enrollment? Yes. So it depends on the class, but in language arts, in specifically, are you speaking about English or because all of the foreign languages are in there as well? For English? Well, for let's say English, what what are we what are we limiting? Okay. Them to? So for the if it's an English class with writing, which there are two or three that fall in that, with the writing component, it's limited to tw well, the maximum is twenty five students. However, it's at the discretion of an instructor to take more, and sometimes they do take up to twenty seven. If it's one of the non writing, so the 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 English 251, 1, 261, and 360 have that requirement. Above that, it's, um, it's higher, so it's not at the 25. Um, but it's, I think it's at 30, Dave probably knows, 30 for the, from English 2 and above, and the, writing, and the literature courses are at 30. For math and for social science, it's at 40. And so the, min, the 
the max class size is 40, but again, it's at the faculty's discretion to add more. And many of, in all of the areas, English included, faculty often add more students based on their room size, based on their capacity. Um, and then there's a lot of courses that we offer in large lecture fashion, like in our Ponderosa, and we have social science, science, fine arts, health and wellness, numerous courses in our Ponderosa building, and that, again, is at a discretion of an instructor to choose those classes, and then the enrollment is up to 200. So it just depends on the area. But for, by, in general, it's 40 for all courses, unless they have a special requirement cap, which is English, our foreign languages, our communication classes, and lab classes that only have a certain space, those would be under the 40. Did that answer it? Yeah, you gave me an answer, but I uh, don't particularly agree with it, but that's just me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. All right, so that, uh, let me get back to my agenda here. And uh, so we just finished up, uh, yeah, we just finished up item one under information. I did notice that Assemblyman Mathis has been able to uh, beat the traffic jam and has been able to join us. And he looks like he has a, a guest with him that <laughs> may be a little antsy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we are going to, uh, go back to the agenda and cover uh, the resolution uh, presentation uh, from Assemblyman uh, Mathis. The podium is yours. Thank you. Um, she, she's restless because we've been up since 4 a.m. She went up to Sacramento and actually got to present a bill this morning, her first ever. So she's done pretty good for today. Child endangerment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I took the truck instead of the car, so, you know, very secured. I, I think these chairs might be the child endangerment yeah. part. Um, be, before I get going, I want to congratulate Lori again for your Thank Woman you. of the Year. Uh, with the city of Tulare. That was a great presentation there. Thank you. But we are here tonight for this resolution. So let me get right to uh, all the whereases. Whereas, the California Community College serves 2.1 million students throughout the state of California and its 114 colleges are dedicated to improving social mobility for Californians and fueling the state's economy. And whereas the California Community College is, has spearheaded an unprecedented effort to provide more and better career education, also known as career technical education, to create one million more middle skill workers, thereby producing a job-ready workforce for employers and lifting low-wage workers into living wage jobs. And whereas the collaborative effort is known as the Strong Workforce Program, an annual recruiting investment of $200 million to spur career education in the California Community College System, which is the nation's largest workforce development system. And whereas, a skill and flexible workforce is key to a strong workforce advancing business performance and supporting California's economic competitive advantage and the essential components of a strong workforce, including jobs that enable citizens social mobility with a substantial increase in earnings and attainment of a living wage. And whereas, through its strong workforce program, College of the Sequoias has proven to advance its students' social mobility throughout criteria and its efforts have earned the institution the designation of strong workforce star. Now, therefore, be it resolved by me, Assembly Member Devin J. Mathis, that I recognize and commend College of the Sequoias for their outstanding contributions to the state of California's workforce efforts through the Strong Workforce Stars program and applaud the institution for the invaluable contributions it has made to the intellectual and social growth of its students and extend best wishes 
for its continued success in the future. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, taking the time to be with us uh, today, Assemblyman Mathis, and uh, we appreciate that. And uh, we certainly agree that the 114 uh, junior colleges in California are uh, striving to uh, continue to do a great job in, uh, in educating our students. And as a matter of fact, our director of career technical education, Dr. Russell, is here today. And if he had the opportunity, he would tell you to keep those uh, strong work workforce dollars coming our direction. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't necessarily sit on that budget committee, but I'll bring it. Well, you have a connection. Thank you. Are you ready to go? <laughs> say bye, everybody. We'll say bye, everybody. <laughs> there it is. It's all right, but these chairs are fun. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. All right, our next two items on the agenda are the quarterly uh, 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 budget accountability update and our quarterly financial report, the CCFS uh, queue of some sort. And I believe that um, in Christine Statton's absence, uh, uh, LeAngela. Miller. Miller I knew there was a, a, a hyphen hyphen hyphenation to it. <laughs> and along with Linda McCauley are going to uh, present, capably present these reports for us today. The first report that we're looking at, this is, uh, comes monthly on Angela, consent. I hate to interrupt. Will you pull that mic down just because that also feeds these microphones and then. Okay. Is that better? Yes, thank, yeah. you. thank you. This first report is comes to the board monthly on consent and we pull it off the consent quarterly to actually present it. Um, one thing I always like to focus on is kind of the middle section where it goes over the detail of the surplus and the deficit so you can see that as it moves up and down depending on decisions that are made. Mm -hmm. So the <coughs> surplus has gone up due to miscellaneous salary changes in the classified unit and that would have to do with um, vacant positions that uh, were filled late. So that was the savings and our surplus is currently 103,000. And if you go to the last page of the report where it talks about the expense changes. Keep going, there you go. Yeah. So letter B, um, I wanted to highlight this. This is the benefits budget. When we adopted the budget, it included 1.6 million to cover the two out years of the PERS and STRS increase. Mm -hmm. And so now we're allocating a portion of those funds out to cover uh, facility, facility one-time projects and technology one-time projects. Mm -hmm. So if you see under letter D, the services, um, it's increased for Cahuilla, Cedar, and Sycamore renovations. And the capital has increased 404,000 for the wireless upgrade and South Sequoia infrastructure. So those are the main changes in this report. Um, the categorical revenue changed slightly. On the first page it went up 122,000 and that is due to um, current community college district Prop 39 allocation increase. So that was a slight increase. Were there any questions on this report? Questions for Leandro. Thank you. There's more. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Thank you for that part. I'm, I'm not getting off that easy. <laughs> I'm thrilled that there's more. You know that. <laughs> the next report is the revenue projections for the year. So we are looking at where we think the revenue will be for throughout the year. And um, the notes that are on this report, uh, the state revenue, if you see the mandate cost line, we've actually um, received 198% of our budget. And that is due to the one-time mandate cost funds of 270,000. We were aware of those funds coming in, we just weren't ready to allocate them out to a project yet. 
They have since been allocated out, and you will see that in March. I mean, yeah, March. Mm -hmm. And the local revenue, um, your main changes are material fees going in, and then the rental income went up 55000 and that's mainly due to the new um, Mooney commercial mm -hmm. property there on Mooney Boulevard. Right. Mm -hmm. Were there any questions on this revenue report? Questions? Nope. All right, you're free to move to the next portion. The next <laughs> report. As, a, as opposed thank to you. saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to tread lightly now. He has a like, fast learner. <laughs> the next report is the um, expense projections for the year. So um, you see there the note I provided that uh, the benefits budget, just to go over that again, it was $1.6 for those two out years. And we put that in there to make sure that we have the money reserved because that's an ongoing ex expense. We know it's coming and we need to take care of it. And then it's been allocated out now. There's 725000 that still has not been allocated out, but it will be soon. Um, if you look at the variance to working budget column, that bottom number, $2.4 million, that's what we're projecting right now would be unspent at year end but that number will change as uh, we start allocating out more funds. Were there any questions on this report? Questions? I, I have one. Uh, Leanne, just take a, uh, just a minute or so. Uh, so tell us, so that I'm sure I understand, we're actually pre-funding the STRS and PERS increases for 18 and 19 mm -hmm. in, in this fiscal year is uh, and 19 and 20 and 19 and 20 so, so for two years so we're out uh, so yes obviously a very uh, uh, ambitious and uh, and good thing to be able to do yeah and we've I'm I'm sorry. sorry we've actually if you remember Kim we actually adopted that practice <coughs> two years ago and we called it if Christine were here she'd use the term we've been conditioning the budget for those new ongoing expenses so it is. It has been a wonderful, um, conservative, but really strong position for our, us to be in to be able to pre-fund those ahead of time. Then, at the conclusion of each of those years, there's a there's some one-time money to be able to do a, a particular project with. But knowing going forward that we've taken general fund revenue and built it into that budget, we have the budget conditioned to pay for those expenses when they arise. And so now we're funded through 1920. Yes. Nice. Yeah, and nice. I failed to mention in my board report, but Greg and I did meet with Christine last week for our mm -hmm. budget subcommittee and went over um, these kind of big items and over the list of priorities, capital projects coming, and we that looked that, that it was very informative, mm -hmm. much a little more detailed than this, but we mm -hmm. appreciated that right. meeting. All right. Well, thank <coughs> you for that information. All right. The next report is the quarterly financial report ending December 31st. This gives you just kind of a, a broader snapshot of the college. Each column is a separate fund grouping. The first column is the general fund, and it shows there our ending fund balance as of December 31st is $21.6 million, and it's up $5.3 million compared to the prior year ending fund balance. This is not a projection of where we would end our fund balance. It's just a point in time. If you look at the Linwood Reserve column, I just wanted to highlight that. It has expenditures of $1.9 million. That was for the purchase of the Mooney Boulevard commercial property. property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were there any questions on this report? Questions? Can you all recall our strategy for replenishing that, uh, that, that fund, that Linwood Reserve, mm -hmm. will be when we get good activity on the Mooney Boulevard property. That's right. what we're working on next. That concludes the budget accountability reports. All right. So uh, any, uh, no, other, no other questions? No. We, <laughs> we are going to move on to item three, correct? <laughs> Yes. She's uh, not moving from the podium. The quarterly <laughs> financial CFS. This is the 311Q report. It's basically a projection of year end as of December 31st. So if you look in the column on the far right, that's our projected. And we're showing 
This is basically based on our working budget. And so we're showing an ending fund balance of 27.2 million. <coughs> I'm sorry, 27.2 percent. Yeah. yeah. And 16 million. Give me wow. that 27 million. <laughs> I'm looking. Where's that number? <laughs> right. And then um, the section two, when you go down, we're projecting 10,089 this year at PES. Mm -hmm. and we are very happy about that. Mm -hmm. Because as we move into the new funding formula, we're guaranteed this year's uh, total computational revenue. So that's a guarantee for next year. So it's been very important that we meet this mid-sized college this year. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the next page of the report just goes over our cash balance. We have 22.7 million. Were there any questions on this report? Questions? Oh. Thank you. Looks good. Happy days. Happy days. <laughs> Linda doesn't Happy get to dance. present. Linda gets to present next. Okay, so. Uh, nice to have you back, B. Angela. And you too, Linda. <laughs> Linda is reporting on. Uh, let me get to my agenda. Okay, well, next up is item four, which is my all-time favorite part of the of the meeting and that's the <laughs> annual Audits. annual audit report uh, and uh, Linda is going to introduce our uh, yes. uh, gentleman evening. giving us the report from VTD good evening everyone um, I have the pleasure tonight to introduce Bill Williams who is one of the partners of uh, Bavernick Trine Day and Company CPAs Bill will be presenting our audited uh, financials for the district as well as uh, our bond audits for fiscal year 16 17 mm -hmm. and I would like to also take this opportunity to thank Bill and his team for the years of service to COS and also <coughs> to thank him for the excellent wealth of knowledge and information that he has provided to Leangela and I over the years so thank you and with that I introduce Bill. Well, good evening, board members, once again. I'll step close to the mic and I'll make it fast. We've got a closed session coming up again. Um, if he says thank you, you know you're done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I will stop at the thank you. I'll uh, freeze Bill, in my I, tracks. I, I went through this. I have it all marked up. I have a lot yeah. of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, again, you know, we completed your audit this year, and um, we just really want to thank the business office and, and admissions office and everyone else. We have to kind of go and pester everybody a couple times a year. Um, once again, very ready for us. Um, people like us kind of to get in and get out pretty quickly. Um, we go through a lot of uh, information here as well as back at the office. Um, with electronic age, we're able to do that much more, which is nice. Kind of takes the heat off of taking up a room. Um, but for your auto report this year, 1617, the bond report will take about one second, so I'll save that till the end, um, just before the thank you. But um, there really hasn't been a whole lot of changes in your audit report this year, the format of it. Um, again, your MDNA, your management discussion analysis, is the only part on your letterhead starts on page five. Meant to be a real quick summary for you. The financial information and any tables, we have dropped in those figures for you um, to make sure that they agree to the audited financial statement numbers. And then um, Linda and Leangela kind of help us through the text and the budget assumptions and accomplishments during the year, um, the text part of that report. But um, right behind that is your big balance sheet here. Again, uh, community colleges are treated like businesses as far as the financial statements go. So these financials up front include all of your operating funds of the district, including the fixed assets, which you have a lot more of now thanks to your bond issuances that have been going on for a number of years, as well as your long-term obligations, um, your debt. So the uh, biggest part of this is your long-term obligations are about 111 million. All of that are geo bonds, except for about three million for the solar project. Um, it's probably a little bit less now. Bill, excuse me, sir. Sure. Are you what? Tell me what page? Uh, Twelve. Uh, sorry. Page twelve. That's what I thought. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other thing that has impacted community colleges and other governments um, is the Sturz and Persnet pension unfunded liabilities. You know your rates are changing. You've set money aside for those rate increases. Um, K-12 districts are hopefully doing the same thing. We're seeing it a lot now. Their general funds are designating a chunk of money, as you did, 
to ease that impact, at least on the district side. Um, but you'll see down at the bottom of this page that your unrestricted net position is a negative number, um, 13.6. That was triggered by recognizing your unfunded portion, your fair share of the Sturz and Purs pension liability. That was a deficit um, impact to you of $43 million this year, so you would have ended up right around $30 million positive if we didn't have to record that. That number is going to be moving, obviously, as that unfunded pension liability <coughs> changes. Um, stock market, ugh, everything you know goes into play with that number. It just depends how the invest investments do. Um, but all in all, you know, really low debt that you're responsible for, which is a great place to be. Public support has been great in this district, um, and all, all of the campuses obviously have um, benefited from that. So there's a number of state compliance areas we look at as well, 50%. You know, you hear about that a lot. You ended the year at 53%. Um, you were pretty comfortably above your 50%. We see a lot of districts just above 50, 50.5. We're not sure how they work that out, but we have to audit it. So we get them close. Um, student financial aid this year, federal compliance is also tested. Sometimes there's one program, student financial aid is always one of those because it's so large, you receive so much money from that. Occasionally there's other federal programs this year, there was just the one. Um, so there were no findings there, which is great, you want to keep it that way. I'm sure the accreditation looks at your audits as well. So there were no state compliance findings um, and there were no federal compliance findings either. So you ended the year fiscally sound and strong um, and as Linda said, we are be handing over the gauntlet here for your audit for a few years. Hopefully you hate them and you come back to us. We miss you. Um, sometimes, you know, we lose an audit and we're like, okay, it's not too bad. But we've really enjoyed um, performing your audits for over the years and working with them. So we did some soul searching and uh, tried to get some bad news about the new firm, but we think you guys will be fine. They'll be easy to work with. Um, we're familiar with them too. So that's the end of your district auto report. Your bonds, they're spent. That's basically what your bond report will say. You had about $700,000 of expenditures and that was it. So there's nothing sitting there out of those bond proceeds. You're probably aware you did have three refundings this year. Those are in your financial statements as well. Um, Linda's hoping that that's the end. So we are done with the bonds. It is a, a little bit of a headache. It's fun for us too, your long-term debt page. West Hills has you beat though. I just was at the board meeting last week. Their summary of long-term debt is a full page. Yours is about 80% of a page. So not that it's a competition. Well, I think that's but good. It's good. I like them about this big, not this big. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. But um, you're in good hands, and we really want to thank you again for having us perform your audit for so many years. Um, we've worked with Stanford a number of years, even before here. So uh, we really appreciate it, and we hope everything works out very well. The funding formula gets figured out, and you can understand it the best way you can. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, questions for Bill? John? I don't have any questions, but I was here when you first came on board. And I remember your early, your early audits were uh, very helpful to the board in seeing what wasn't, just, wasn't what it should be. We made a lot of changes because of the, of the advice your friend gave us. You've been a tremendous help to this college. Thank you very much. I'm positive we'll see you again. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you well know, it's considered by many, including myself, that changing orders from time to time is a prudent thing to do. It uh, doesn't mean it won't, won't, we won't welcome you back when it's your turn. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. I totally understand that. Absolutely. That's part of our business, too. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Bill, just yes. uh, uh, so am, am I uh, the, the report on the bonds, so is this the last uh, report we'll have it on those? It will be the last so, one you'll so be required to have, This yet. is the final one. If you spend so, a dollar, you need the report. You don't have anything to spend now, unless you issue more. Yeah, Bill, could I just <laughs> ask you? <laughs> uh, That's a possibility of issuing more. Eventually. Until we, have, we have room, yeah, we have room. We need it to, the math to work. <laughs> right, so that would... Uh, mm -hmm. do, you, do you have this yes. report with you? Would, would you look at page 11? I just had sure. a, uh, you know, and, uh, just something that I was curious about. So on page 11, mm -hmm. you know, where we started off with the outstanding uh, bond obligation of 94 million, right. and those are the, you know, these are bonds C, I, and J, for Larry <coughs> Hanford, Vicelia. Right. And then you're, we did some refinancing of those bonds. Right. So here they show you know, in the redeemed column, I right, suspect. Right. So, but our bonds didn't go down by 48 million right. because it's showing a balance here of 48. Right. Your what, what piece aren't, am I missing? The, your refundings are not on here. So what replaced the old bonds, the refundings don't get included in your bond report itself because oh, they, they weren't the original issuance. 
On page 41 in the big report, you I will did, see it. I did see it over right. there, and I just didn't see it here. Right, so, exactly. Uh, it's just the outstanding balance of the original bonds that were issued. All right. Well, listen, I appreciate no problem. Uh, uh, that. And, uh, Bill, with, uh, if, uh, to the extent that you've had anything to do with uh, uh, the training for Leandra and Linda, you done a great job because I believe they do a great job. They do. And we pick so, their brain a lot, too. We learned as much from uh, our CBOs when I uh, When I did auditing, I only wished that I had staff as capable as I believe our staff to be. They're very and good. that wasn't always the case. So Let your auditors uh, sleep better at night, knowing that, too. All right. Well, uh, thank you. That's my thank you. Okay. Good night. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, I, I've been an otter in my past life, and I, I've never had a round of applause. Yeah. Uh, so I know that that's uh, that you, need to, that's you need to meet with Bill and <laughs> you know, find out what he's doing. Stan, it might be multiple reasons. <laughs> All right, consent calendar. All items listed on the consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. An item may be removed from the consent calendar at the request of any member of the Board of Trustees or any person in the audience and is considered uh, and will be considered as a separate agenda item. Are there any items on the consent calendar which uh, that uh, anyone would like to have pulled? Yeah, let's see. Uh Payment bills, which one is that here? It's number seven. Need to pull that one, please. Mm -hmm. Item seven will yeah. be removed from the consent calendar. Any others? All right, so I would accept a motion for the approval uh, of the consent calendar absent item number seven. So um, Second. Uh, so moved. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any additional discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. Uh, consent calendar is approved. Now we will deal individually with item seven. Item seven, there's three bills in here that uh, Evangelo C. I, I, I had done some work for him. I, I meant to go back and look and see if it's been long enough if I can vote or not. I forgot to do it, so I'll be prudent to disqualify myself. Okay, so we just need John to be able to abstain on those. All right, so uh, that is duly noted. Uh, so I would accept a motion for uh, item seven of the consent calendar. So moved. Second. We have a motion for uh, approval of uh, item seven on the consent calendar. Uh, is there any additional discussion? If not, all those uh, in favor, uh, approve by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, uh, motion, uh, I will. Uh, 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 motion is approved, and let the record show that uh, board members on Walt abstained from the uh, from that action. Thank you. Steve, are you going to Arizona? No. Nope. Okay. I was going to say I have a great trip, but okay. <laughs> your department is. Okay. Consent calendar. Uh, so now we are on to uh, uh, curriculum item eleven. Dr. Lucerne. I'm here, but. Um, Trustee Cardoza, on Wednesday evening, the students that are going to Arizona did their practice runs in the theater, and it was fabulous. They're oh, so good. We're going to have not. award winners again. That's so great. They do a great job. Another, another projection. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're going to write. It's recorded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, you have before you the curriculum report that has already been approved by the Curriculum Committee and the Academic Senate, and it's recommended that the board approve this report. On um, page one, you have new curriculum. These are new courses, and they're in agriculture and industry technology, and these are for two of our new programs, one in ag business and the other one in the industrial automation certificate. On page two... You have one more new course that's also in the um, in that auto industrial ma maintenance certificate. There's a modification to physics 57, and you have two course deletions for courses no longer being offered in INT and paralegal. There's one new program, which is an AAT for transfer, which is the law, public policy, and society, and that'll be that's for our pathway to law school students and allows them a seamless transfer to the CSU. I believe we're the first or second K 
community college to have this one, where there's only a couple that are going to have this AAT, so that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Then there's <coughs> modifications to programs. These are for two-year review um, in automotive air conditioning. And then on the third page, there are automotive, our Cisco Academy, construction and floor technology. They're, these are all here for um, two-year review for a career technical education. And on the last page, we again have modifications and also all here for a two-year review in landscape and ornamental horticulture. And the recommendation is that the board approve this report. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second for the approval of the uh, curriculum report. Uh, just a quick question, mm -hmm. if I could. Uh, Cisco, does that refer to the company Cisco? Is that what that is? Or, or what is the Cisco software Cisco system. CC and A Cisco. Yeah, it's uh, that's the company, and then they uh, offer a. Um, and I apologize, but I don't remember what the CCNA stands for. But it's a certification that we offer here, right. and we have to be. We have a, an agreement with them, a contract with them to be able to offer this academy here. Okay. John? On page four, uh, there's a modification program called Landscape Design. It says this certificate prepares students for entry level employment in the field of landscape design. Students completing the certificate require skills to success in, in success refining and designing residential landscapes and gardens using current standards and plant material. Um, I, I, uh, I'd like to talk at another time on this with you. Uh, the law is changing rapidly now where uh, what cities and the civil estate is requiring cities to require uh, landscaping to comply with certain water usage and plant material to, to that. And, and typically they're requiring a landscape architect certificate for a lot of this stuff. Uh, just a word of caution. Uh, we need to make sure that we're training people to, to, for jobs that exist. And uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, this may be a wonderful program, I don't know, but it, you need to look at it in that light. Is mm -hmm. How does that fit in with the real practices currently? So one of, rapidly. Thank you. And one of the purposes of a two-year review for career technical education programs is it exactly that reason. They're part of that review. They're required to submit updated labor market information and updated, so the number of faculty, the number of jobs, the, the textbooks, everything for that program, they update through that two-year review. And that is absolutely one of the things that they're required to look at is the labor market information. And so, and that, that is reviewed again by the curriculum committee and the academic senate to, to verify that, that there's still a need. But like that all the new housing you see go in or, or just a doctor's office someplace, some landscape architect signed off on it, not one of these. So okay. I don't know how that fits in. Okay, and I'll make sure to mention that to Dr. Waldner who is in charge of that program. <laughs> Oh, she's here. <laughs> Let me mention that to you, Dr. Mulder. She's not going to say nothing. I heard it the other day. There you have it. The right person's in the room. <laughs> I don't expect any answers sitting here. And okay. I don't, you don't even need to report back. Okay. I, I would, I'd be happy Thank you. if you all satisfied yourself that, that this was good. Thank you. All right, very good. Any other questions? So we have a motion in the second. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. All right. Uh, item 12, consideration of sabbatical funding for 2018-2019. Okay. You will recall uh, that we had the opportunity last year to re-engage in consideration of approval for sabbaticals after a fairly long uh, hiatus while we were coming out of the recession and reestablishing our accreditation. So it was just a, a good thing last year to be able to return to consideration for sabbatical. In that process, we were able to, I think, uh, more clearly define going forward the role and responsibility of uh, the collaborative parties in reaching a decision on sabbaticals. And as a result of that, we did an update to both our board policy, uh, actually our administrative procedure, and created a board policy. So now we have both the BP and the AP, which I think um, prescribe 
the roles and responsibilities of the board and the academic senate and by extension our faculty enrichment committee in that process so as a result we're here as our new ap states at our regularly scheduled board meeting in the month of february to uh, ask the board to consider uh, units of funding for sabbaticals for the subsequent year so that would be for our 18 19 year as we're in the beginning now of our budget development process and so um, without uh, participating in the review of the particular merit of the sabbatical proposals the board is really being asked and, and it was your decision last year to um, relegate yourselves to the role and responsibility for establishing uh, sabbaticals as a funding priority for the annual budget so we have a recommendation or we have a uh, the backup before you and an opportunity for you as a board to consider funding for the 18 19 year for sabbaticals and we ask that you consider that in number of semesters that you might uh, approve for funding and upon your approval then the uh, district staff myself and Vice President Staten in particular will work to make sure that that funding is incorporated into next year's budget. All right. So let's uh, open it up for discussion. So and, uh, I have a question though. Then, so if mm -hmm. it's per sem per semester, we're not necessarily dictating when they need to be taken. They well, they'll either one <coughs> or how is that? The, the uh, sabbaticals currently are awarded either in a semester or a two semester sabbatical. So uh, we're asking you to fund a number of semesters. Last year we funded a one semester sabbatical and a one okay. semester sabbatical was taken, reviewed and reported back to us. Okay. Uh, but there are sub sabbatical proposals that could span two semesters. We wouldn't be in a position, we the board wouldn't be in a position to decide how the semesters were allocated. We just are in a position to allocate funding for either one semester, two semester, three semester, semester as a unit of funding. Got it, so if we do two semesters, that could be just one. Proposal. Could, if that's what. That's leaving it up to the. That's that's up to the if that's what FEC okay, decided. That was my, that was my question, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, Mr. Zumwalt. Has either FEC or the Academic Senate made a specific request of, as far as the number of the semesters? No. It's not part of the process, or we could have. Right. It wasn't in the AP that, that the request came from us. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, let me ask another question. And, and it is, if the board, uh, not that we would, but if we chose to uh, finance more uh, semesters than the fact and the Senate were prepared to, to approve, uh, uh, what, how how many? How many? How many? Uh, how many requests of substance are out there? Well, here's here's the issue. You just added a term that. In their opinion, not yours. Okay, but you said of substance. Yeah. In their opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> the last time there was um, three proposals of substance that the faculty enrichment committee um, approved and brought before the board. Um, and part of the issue is too is it's a lot of the training has to go into the faculty since we haven't done this in so long about what the expectations are. So they're going to be, and part of it is now also that as we go forward with the training, we will now be able to say to faculty, we have X number of semesters. Yeah. It's a lot of work for the faculty to put forward a proposal. And so going forward then they'll say if there's only one semester then okay, you know, do I want to put in that time? That will be their choice, of course. But, you know, it's um, it's hard to know. This is, will be only the second time we've done it in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I know that previously, um, we, you know, way before they stopped doing it, there were times that, that at least there was five or six semesters worth of sabbaticals in a year. So that was not unheard of. So would it be easier for you if we only proved one semester as opposed to two? No. Okay. It's, not, it's not easier for me at all. Okay. It's, it's not even easier for the committee. It, it's a question of the faculty and whether or not the faculty have a project that they feel strongly enough about to go through the process. Well, and I think, I guess it would be, would it be safe to say, though, if I think John's question, and let me 
make sure I'm asking it correctly, if the board approved more semesters than the committee felt could fill those spots, then they would just say, even though we have six proposals, we're only going to fill two. So, I can speak to that. Oh, sure. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, as chair of the fact, I have no interest in the board of the sabbaticals that aren't meritorious and don't and aren't rigorous as by, by our rubric, which you've seen the version of uh, the last cycle, which was also forward in essentially the same form uh, this year. So if there were three semesters or three units approved and at our meeting uh, and vetting the proposals it looked like two were really you know, worth it and they really, we really couldn't see a third one making it, I feel confident our committee would forward just the two. Okay. And we know that. I think we're just asking for mm -hmm. <laughs> clarification. <laughs> well, and you'll remember last year when we talked about putting this AP together and we talked about the sequencing of this, that was kind of the, the difficult dilemma is faculty would like to know if the board's role is going to be to, to fund semesters for sabbaticals, how many semesters are going to be funded. Then we have an idea of whether or not we have an interest and want to jump in the mix. If we were waiting to see how many great proposals came forward and then decide how many we would fund, that takes us a little bit back to where we were. And what faculty would say is, that's a head scratcher too, because I don't want to go to the effort to put this all together. If I, if I know there's six, five or six proposals and then the board decides we're only going to fund two. I get it, I so. get it. All right, I'll, I'll jump out there. Is that, first of all, in my opinion at least, the, the sabbatical we did fund it, did fund was of substance. I think that, 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 that what was presented for us, there's, there's some good material there. Uh, we'll see how, how, it, how it, it improves the college. I, I, I know that there's different perspectives of what these things are for, but I, I, I feel even better when I think it improves the college. Uh, anyway, uh, 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 I'm glad we funded that sabbatical. I think it was worth, worthwhile for a lot of reasons, not just the ones that I, not just that the college benefited, but I think it's something that, that enriches the faculty as well. Uh, I think also the FEC committee is well aware of this board's attitude about the quality, quality sabbaticals are necessary to have more sabbaticals. And uh, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I'll put it out there as, as the college is fairly very well off right now compared to some times in the past. And I'd like to see us fund two semesters uh, this time around, and, and uh, hopefully we get that. We'll see if we get two good ones back. <coughs> Anybody uh, else? I better, I better, better finish. Motion? I better finish what I said. Not two ones back to decide whether they're, they're going to do it or not. Two back after they're done to yeah. decide whether we like it. All, yeah, all we're all we're responsible for now is approving just how many are funded. Yes, and I, I, yes, that's a motion. And I, I'm just going to add a comment. I agree with John, and I do look forward, though, also to hearing feedback on, you know, the AP and the process and how it's working in order for us to continue to make it better. If there's some need there in terms of if there's missing pieces or parts that maybe didn't get done, so it'd be nice if the board could hear some feedback as well. I second the motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, the only other comment I would make is uh, I, I, I agree with uh, approval, and uh, I have uh, confidence in the uh, FET committee, and uh, I trust their, uh, their judgment based on what we've seen, uh, uh, you know, in the short time that we have funded that. So uh, I, I'm happy to uh, approve that as well. So uh, uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, no additional questions, I suspect. So uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, thank you very much. All right. Uh, contract with Barnes & Noble uh, for the bookstore. Item 13, lucky 13. COS has been in contract with Barnes & Nobles for the last nine years to manage our bookstore. Um, that current contract is up March 31st, 2018. So we thought it was a good time at now to go out for a request for proposal again to, to make sure that we had the best offer and the best company to run our bookstore. 
Um, we went out for RFP in December 2017. The proposals were due back January 18, 2018. We received two proposals, one from Follett Higher Education Group and one from Barnes & Noble's College Booksellers. Follett does not offer a hybrid system that we use here where we have um, them managing the store, but we still have district employees. So that's one of the downsides of Follett. Um, when we went through their proposals, um, we ranked them on a rubric, and Barnes & Noble's received 363 points, and Follett received 307 points. If you turn the page, this is really the notes from the review of the proposal. Um, these were kind of the main items we were pulling out. Uh, were they willing to reimburse the district for our uh, district employees? Um, Follett said no, that that was already included in their proposal. So that then kind of affects the um, commission rate that they were offering, because at first glance they were offering a much higher commission rate than Barnes & Noble's, mm -hmm. but Barnes & Noble's is commission plus they're reimbursing for the district employees. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I kind of wanted to highlight is that um, the way that the sellers affect our students, Follett applies, um, they add shipping and handling costs to the price of the bookstore and passes that on to the student. Mm -hmm. Barnes and Nobles considers that a cost of doing business and they do not pass that on. <coughs> It is recommended that uh, the Board of Trustees approve the proposed five-year contract with Barnes & Nobles to commence April 1st and end March 31st. Um, commission rate for Barnes & Nobles is 10% up to 1.5 million and 11.5% over um, 1.5 million. Our estimate that this would be Based on the prior year sales, this would be about 198,000 per year. We also have attached the actual uh, proposal from Barnes and Nobles. They're offering a um, $50,000 sign-on bonus, um, so that's a one-time bonus. And then they're also offering an annual $5,000 um, textbook scholarship, and that would be administered by our foundation. Okay, so I'm sure we have some questions for uh, Lee Angela. This is the first time I recall going through this uh, process on uh, on a bookstore, but mm -hmm. I can gather that books are quite expensive, <coughs> as if I didn't know that already. Uh, questions from the board? So if I read it correctly, then they're going to hire the manager now. No. No. They, they, they're going to pick up the salary of that manager. Okay. okay. Well, it's a CSEA it, employee, correct? No. no. The manager no. will be an employee of Barnes & Noble. Oh, the manager. And then they will reimburse us for our classified staff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have we have a, a manager for Is that different than what we have now, though? Yes. yes. Doriana, okay, the current right. bookstore yep. manager, she retired, she retired in December. Got it. Uh, right. Oh. So this was an opportunity to transition that over. Right. Okay. Um, Other as, questions? On a side note, they have pretty much already offered the management position to one of our current employees out there. Okay. They, that it's a classified it. employee. Okay. That's mm -hmm. already working in the bookstore. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good to know. And they've been easy to work with. Obviously, or you wouldn't be recommending staying with them. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. So moved. Second. Motion and a second for approval of the uh, agreement with uh, Barnes & Noble. Uh, additional questions from uh, board members or student board member? None. Uh, if none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Thank you Angela. <coughs> all right, board policies. Item 14. This is a second and possible <coughs> final reading of these two board policies. The first is 6340, which we reviewed uh, for you at our last meeting, and it covers new language required under um, public contract code 
in law for the awarding of bids and contracts and steps that public agencies need to adhere to in order to do that. And the second one is 6343, and it's a little bit of cleanup language on our uh, board policy for joint powers authority agreements. And um, in particular, um, our OPEB JPA. So these are second and final readings. If you have any questions uh, that have surfaced over the last month, we'll try to answer. If not, our recommendation is that the board take action to approve these BPs at their second reading. Questions, comments? I move we waive the second reading and approve policy, board policies 6340 and 6343. Second. We have a motion and a second for uh, uh, approval of BP 6340 and 6343. Additional <coughs> questions or comments? If none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right, item 15, uh, mission statement. Okay, you have before you this evening a proposed uh, revision to our College of the Sequoia's mission statement. Just to give this a little bit of context, it's uh, not often that a college considers revision to its mission statement. This, however, is the result of our integrated planning process and timeline. And one of the things that we do every three years is our district governance senate appoints a task force to do a review of the district's mission statement. We've done this uh, at least once. Uh, in our last six year cycle and now this is the second time. This time around we're a little bit better, a little more experienced now in our planning processes and in the formation and efforts of our task forces. There was a, a district wide survey sent out by the task force, uh, an opportunity for uh, students, staff and faculty to provide feedback on the college mission statement. One of the predominant uh, sources of feedback. One of the most consistent remarks were that our current mission statement, the way it's written and the way it's displayed, is lengthy. It, it doesn't um, serve uh, as many feel a mission statement should to be a more short and more concise statement that's, that's re rememberable or memorable and that you can recite. So the recommendation was to consider shortening the mission statement so that it's uh, more impactful and um, also to consider uh, when we publish that mission statement and when we uh, display it, that it be accompanied by the college's vision statement, which is also um, a, a support document describing the college's core values and, and expanding a little bit on what the mission statement itself says. So the recommendation before you this evening, you can see the memo that came to me from the co-chairs of the District Governance Senate having um, convened that task force, completed the process. We went an extra step and held an additional meeting and opened up a little uh, College of the Sequoias forum for any and all district staff and members to come in. Um, I think everybody realized when we were on the brink of adjusting our mission statement that it was kind of a big deal. And so we wanted to make sure that we did that with everyone's uh, full input and feedback. The other thing I guess that snuck up on us a little bit is and it's built into this evening's recommendation, is that we're also right in the middle right now of completing our, our, our accreditation self-study. And so much of our accreditation self-study self now is tied to, in many ways, the language that's in our current mission statement. So the <coughs> recommendation before you this evening is not only to consider approval of this revised mission statement, which was developed and is now being presented in accordance with our planning, integrated planning manual, but to delay its full implementation for one year until the fall of 2019 so that we complete our current uh, institutional self-evaluation for our accreditation, that we have our visiting team come next fall in October <coughs> and the existing mission statement still be intact and in place because that's what our report is based on. And then uh, we begin in the second semester of 1819, preparing for 
implementation, which would be new posters, new documents, new material to distribute that would have our new, more succinct mission statement, and it would then also be accompanied by our vision statement. So those are, the, those are the items before you this evening. One more little caveat is we probably will take a look as this was all done and we were having conversations with Senate, with District Governance Senate. We realized that we might not wanna do the review and revision of the mission statement every three years. That a mission statement probably because it's big should only be reviewed every 10 years on the cycle with your master plan. Because we're a little we're a little worried. This, in this case, I think we're fortunate because the mission statement is going to be shortened, but not lose anything that was intact in the longer statements. But as a matter of review every three years, if you've made some significant change in your mission statement, you could be out of whack with your 10-year master plan. So one idea that might surface is taking a look at that and aligning the review of the mission statement more with the actual review and renewal of the master plan. But that's a correction or an adjustment we can make. What's before you tonight is consideration of approval of a more succinct mission statement for implementation fall of 2019. All right, seems to make uh, sense. Spring. Uh, fall of 2019. Questions, comments? And the purpose of approving it now is as opposed to later? It's, it's been done. The process was just completed. The recommendation's done. It's being brought before you now because we completed that as part of the three-year cycle. The three-year cycle ended now, Greg. If we waited another year, we'd be a, a year into the plan. next three years. Three years yeah. So moved. Second. Motion and a second for the approval of the revised uh, mission statement to be uh, effective uh, fall of... Uh, 2019. Is there any additional uh, comments, questions, or um, if not, um, uh, my only comment is, uh, you know, it, it seems to read well and makes sense to me. So, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. There you have it. All right. Uh, Item 16 comes out as a result of our board retreat, I believe. Our, Correct. Uh, uh, board, uh, uh, annual board priorities, item 16. Yes, so as you will recall, at the retreat, we took a little time to take a look at the current year, 17-18 um, board priorities. And with your discussion and feedback, uh, we have drafted these as the board priorities for 1819. So what's bold and underlined is new. And of course, what we have a, a strike through is being recommended for deletion. Seems to match my recollection. Mm -hmm. Me too. Anybody else? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve the revised uh, uh, board priorities 2018 2019. Is there any additional uh, comments or discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That takes us to the uh, conclusion of our open session, and the board shall uh, adjourn. Uh, to uh, finish up the closed session.